Good morning, everyone. I'll read a, a brief statement here about Dana. In Buddhism, when Zen practitioners share their understanding of the teachings and practice, it is offered freely as a practice of Dana Paramita. Dani is a Pali word that means generosity or to give freely. And this practice is done without expectation of getting something in return. This is the spirit of speaking about the Dharma. Other ways to practice dana are to offer support to those who share the teachings, to support places of spiritual practice, and to give without judgment of expectation when opportunities arise. And those who share the teachings at Great Tree do so on a dana basis. Please support their practice by giving what you can. You can either do this directly or through Great Tree. And we will pass it on to them. So thank you, Reverend Rendo, and thank you to Great Tree for um, the space and the time and the opportunities that you give. And in the chat is, an, is the um, donation page for Great Tree. Um, and Reverend Rendo has asked that all donations go directly to Great Tree. And um, please send an email to info at greattreetemple.org, just specifying that the Donna is connected to um, Reverend Rendo's talk. And um, this is this is being recorded as well and will be on Great Trees and Women's Temple YouTube page. Um, and yeah, with that, I'll invite Anne to unmute herself and um, give a brief introduction. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for the reminder to unmute. Um, <laughs> Reverend Rendo Jonathan Flaum is a Soto Zen monk who ordained at Great Tree Temple um, with um, um, ordained by Tejo in 2011. Rendo has been married for 25 years and has two teenagers. He's a writer and has spent a lot of time as a milkman his business um, distributing the dairy products of the Amish in North Carolina operates out of uh, Asheville and Charlotte. During the pandemic, he converted his kids' old playhouse into a tiny temple where he will be speaking from today. You can learn more about this and other things at his website, which is www.ashevilletinytemple.org. So, Without further ado, uh, Reverend Rendo. And thank, thanks so much, and Trey. Thanks so much. So appreciate what you what you do um, for me and what what you, what you're doing for Great Tree. And thanks to everyone for for being here. It's really nice to see you. I I, I don't I deeply appreciate it. It, it's 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 you know it's it's a Saturday morning. It's your time, and, and for you to be here means means a whole lot to me. So thank you. Um, so so we're going to talk about fear today, and inviting fear in. And I have some practical things about that, and I want to uh, speak to kind of how, how I discovered this process can, can really work and then uh, share it with you because it's been, it's been so helpful to me. And at the same time, really um, kind of visit a little bit because, because, because a lot of this process is very imaginative and visit a little bit um, just how fascinating we are as human beings, how fascinating it is to be able to um, sit on the cushion in Zazen and to let go of thought and to continue that practice of letting go of thought when we catch ourselves thinking um, and we're aware of it, to just let it go. 
um, just like letting a little uh, flower petal go into the stream and, and, and letting it go by. Um, so to not use our imagination in the, in the setting of Zazen. Um, but sometimes to deal with something like fear, I have found that using the imagination can really um, be of service. So I, I guess in this talk, I'm also hoping that we get something about um, how we can utilize and complement um, the letting go of Zazen and sometimes the constructive imagination that we need to visit with something like fear when it feels really overwhelming and powerful. So. I want to start by just reading this, which I, which came across from Suzuki Roshi, which I just like so much in terms of what it says about the Zazen and, and, and how it comes up on our everyday lives. So just, just listen for a minute. A Zen poem says, after the wind stops, I see a flower falling. Because of the singing bird, I find the mountain calmness. Before something happens in the realm of calmness, we do not feel the calmness. Only when something happens within it, do we find the calmness. There is a Japanese saying, for the moon, there is the cloud. For the flower, there is the wind. When we see a part of the moon covered by a cloud or a tree or a weed, we feel how round the moon is. But when we see the clear moon without anything covering it, we do not feel that roundness the same way we do when we see it through something else. When you are doing Zazen, you are within the complete calmness of your mind. You do not feel anything. You just sit. But the calmness of your sitting will encourage you in your everyday life. Even though you do not feel anything when you sit, if you do not have this Zazen experience, you cannot find anything. You just find weeds or trees or clouds in your daily life. You do not see the moon. Anyway, this, this really spoke to me in terms of very much letting Zazen be Zazen sitting without, um, without construction, without trying to um, construct our lives or, or deconstruct our lives there, just allow ourselves to be empty and allow the reality um, that we're impermanent, that we can get to um, we can and do get to the end of, of any given Zazen period or any given period of days and realize we, we're, a, we're a different person. We're not who we were 40 minutes before the, the period started. And we're not who we are on this Saturday compared to who we were on last Saturday, for example. Um, we think we are. And in, in, our, in, in terms of conventional reality, Yes, we, we, we look um, pretty similar to where we looked a week ago. Um, but a lot's changed. Things, things constantly get um, um, reconfigured. Um, and I just think that's, that's fascinating, that's beautiful, and something really important to keep in mind. Um, I, I, I want to go back a little bit and say how this process came to me about how to work with fear. Um, and this first came up, in, you know, in a, in a, in a very literary uh, sense. Years before, when I, you know, I, in, in college, I studied religion, I, I, and I, I also studied playwriting. And I, and I worked as a playwright for a while. But where that 
where that impetus to to want to write plays came from was in a comparative study of religion as an undergraduate. And at the time I was studying, you know, I, I grew up Jewish, have a real sense of um, what, you know, what Judaism means to me and what that's about. And, you know, and as a college student got very interested in, in Buddhism and I was doing a, a comparative senior project uh, on Judaism and Buddhism. And one of, one of the things that always bothered me from the time I was a kid that I always struggled with was particularly this story in, in Genesis called the, in Hebrew called the Akedah, the story where um, God asked Abraham to take Isaac up to um, Mount Moriah and, and sacrifice him. Um, and then at the last minute, of course, Isaac is saved and, and the ram appears in, in the thickets and, and Abraham, you know, God said, you don't have to do that, but I see how faithful you were and, and um, sacrificed the ram instead. So I, as a child, that, that story really felt cruel and scary. As an adult, it, it also felt cruel that that god would ask that of of someone to prove their their faith and love um as i got older read more and more commentaries got into it read jewish commentaries christian commentaries read kierkegaard has a wonderful book on the akeda um i was doing all of this as as an undergrad but what i found the part of the story i was most interested in that um genesis doesn't talk about is what happened on the walk down the mountain. I, 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 I often thought about what they were doing on the way up the mountain and what happened on top. But what was that conversation like? What was Abraham saying to Isaac about what just happened up there? They had him tied down and he, he nearly killed him. And then oh, I didn't have to, but I was going to. And, and, and what was that relationship like and what was going on for Isaac? In the in the midrash, from the rabbis talk about you know later, in the in in the Torah we read that uh, Isaac was became blind as as many of you probably know that's how he was tricked by Jacob to give him the blessing rather than Esau because he couldn't you know couldn't tell the difference between them. Um, he became blind and, there, and some of the rabbis commented that Isaac became blind because of the trauma of, of what happened on Mount Moriah. But anyway, for me, and I, I had a wonderful um, major professor at the time, former Jesuit priest who I learned so much from, wonderful guy. And I had this idea that I, and I was studying Rinzai, um, Zen at the time, really interested in, in koans and, and um, Rinzai Zen. I was, so I was studying Lin, Linji and Chinese Zen and Chan and Rinzai and doing that at the time. Hadn't, hadn't discovered Dogen yet. Um, so I had this idea that I wanted to write a play uh, and, and set, a, set the characters where they can be living at the same time and that Abraham was had now brought Isaac back home and he was going on a journey trying to contemplate what happened up there on that mountain what took hold of him and 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 I set things up in such a way where from in a happenstance sense he would meet Rinzai and they would take this journey together and have this conversation um and that was a way for me to really better understand Abraham and, and, a, and a way to put a character in there who wasn't afraid, who wasn't by driven, wasn't driven by the same motivations by Abraham, didn't have the same um, theological construct and beliefs that Abraham did, and just be able to uh, question him and, and to see what was going on and to bring some some more light and some more freedom to um, what I perceive at the time as Abraham's constrictions and, and, and limitations in, in, in his life. And this put me on a very imaginative journey in writing plays and, and you know, putting different characters in there that I wanted to understand. And I saw that 
um, again, as the playwright, just how vast we are, just how many characters can live within us, how many things can be conjured of people that we know and, um, and of people that we imagine and of people that we know and then take them, take them in a very imaginative place. And it started where I knew what I knew about um, Abraham from reading uh, the Bible and commentaries. I knew what I knew about Rinzai from reading his sayings and reading some history, but putting them together and putting them in conversation really kind of got me going on, on a journey. Um, so, you know, a little background for me, that's just been my process for almost 30 years of when things come up, putting them in, imagining them in conversation with, with other things. And um, over time, I have found it really useful to do this with emotions as well. Uh, to actually, like I said, we are so impermanent. We're not who we were 40 minutes ago. And we're not who we were a week ago, certainly not who we were a year ago. Um, and so everything's coming and going. And when there's something like uh, real ecstasy and joy happening, um, it's wonderful. You don't really think about it coming and going. It's, it's, it's it almost it feels like maybe it feels like it can never go away. Um, but it certainly doesn't bother you. But when something like fear comes up, um, as opposed to a quality of emotion like sadness, I always feel like sadness isn't so bad to deal with. Sadness isn't quite so sticky. It seems like when I can get to a place like sadness and grief about something, um, I don't know, it, it can kind of, um, it has an opening in it where it where it feels like given enough time it will leave and i think emotions like um fear or anger which i see as very very connected sort of two sides of the same coin depending on on on, on where you are um they can feel really sticky like they don't um, you don't see how they're going to leave right away. And they're almost like one of those um, little puzzles or, or little kind of locks like that sort of uh, that almost that as a kid that that Chinese finger um, little trap where you put a finger in each side and the, and the harder you would pull the more the more you to be stuck in there, you know, sometimes like you get stuck in a little spot and the, and, and the, the, the more you try to get out of it, um, the tighter the grip gets. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. And I, and I, and I think um, in my experience, fear is one of those things that can come up and the more you want it to go away, the more it can um, tighten its grip. And, and, and really feel substantial, really feel like it's raining fear and there's not shelter and you can't get out of it. And the more you look for shelter, the more afraid that you are. So, um, and I think when you're, when you're afraid to that degree, for whatever reason, something uh, emotionally that's come up, something physical that's come up, um, what 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 whatever it is, I think it's just part of the part of dukkha, part of that first noble truth that um, we get really afraid. Um, I, I I wrote a, like a few basic samples. Let me see here. Um, it, 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 first of all, I said, it's nothing to be ashamed of or try to hide. Well, and, and I gave a few examples. We, we can fear losing our place of security. We can fear, we fear losing our stature. We can fear losing our health, fear losing our money, fear losing our loved ones, 
fear of missing an opportunity, fear the opportunity once we get it, fear losing our partner, fear of committing fully, fear of not getting a chance to do what we really want to do, fear of being able to do what we want to do, but it not going well. So it, it, we fear. Um, it's something that, that just comes up. So what, one of the things I discovered, kind of like with Abraham and Rinzai, is that, and, and, and how I started with the, with, the, um, with the poem here, that even when I'm experiencing fear, if I just can let the fear be there, not try to push it off, um, but just really sort of settle into the fact and own the fact that this body and mind feels afraid right now and just be with that. That there is other characters present. Be because of our impermanence, because of our multiplicity, um, many other things are present when fear is also present. Fear just has a way of, of kind of um, making itself very big in, in certain moments. And um, it's hard to see the other things are, are present. It's kind of like fear is shining a light on itself and, and, and we don't know the other things are there. But something like Zazen, something like just being, being quiet, as, as I read in the early from Suzuki Roshi, you know, how, how does Zazen help us in, in that moment? Well, maybe we can't sit and, and immediately let go of fear because it's very grippy. Um, but we can see that simultaneously when fear is there, this was, this was my big discovery, which I thought, oh, this is great. Um, I, I, that when fear is there and you're quiet enough, still enough with it, that you can see that also calm is there that calm is, is somewhere also present. I, I, I was interested to hear something recently of a, a study of people who died in, in the wilderness um, when, when, they, when they were lost. And the, the researcher you know, had all kind of different, you know, different physical reasons of, of what happened. But ultimately, the way the stories unfold is that people die in the wilderness um, from confusion. They, they start doing really bizarre things when, when fear takes hold. It, it's, it, it, it becomes really difficult to think clearly. So for me, it, it was a great discovery to see that simultaneously, when fear is there, um, calm is also there it, hidden at first but somehow it it's also there so i've really experimented with well how can i bring calm um more more there to to fear how can i not renounce fear and as this title of this talk says invite fear to the table fear is there how do i um uh, just uh, say, okay, this is a friend who's, who's come in, uh, come into the house, come to sit at the table and just, and just be with it. So I, I have kind of uh, four things here that, that I, I, I've seen that really work with fear. So one is, is to accept fear, a accept it as a friend, accept that it too like everything else that all beings that come up, all beings that we're, we're vowing to, to save, everything that comes up, somehow it, it's okay. It, it's okay. It, 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 it doesn't have to be pushed away. So accept that fear is there. And then even though it might be difficult, try to befriend it, be, befriend the fear. Some people, it, it feels hard to befriend at first because you think, are they going to, you know, um, uh, 
not respect my boundaries or they're going to hurt me somehow or whatever but try to remember fear is is, is not going to hurt you to 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 be befriend fear fear is just fear nothing if we just open the hand with it then it's not going to do anything it's just it's just afraid so to befriend fear and then the third when we notice fear is there really don't don't leave it alone don't leave it alone bring bring a presence to fear see if that calm presence can can arise to bring to fear and then the the fourth one so first is accept second is befriend third is don't leave it alone uh, under any circumstance and then the fourth one is to remember even though that fear it might be the first responder to a situation. So a situation in your life has come up, whether you're literally lost in the woods or you've just lost something physically that's very important or something emotionally that's very important, whatever, where, where fear comes up. Let, just know that this is okay. This is natural. This is a, this is a message that fear is often the first responder to a situation in our life but just be clear and direct about this truth it, to fear and to yourself. Fear might be the first responder, but fear is not the physician. You know, if, if, if somebody is having an emergency out there in the field, there's going to be a first responder to try to get that person in an ambulance to a place where a, where a trained physician can can work with this person and 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 really help them so accept befriend don't leave alone and that fear is just the first responder not the physician and that and that it, it's it's okay um so in terms of in terms of some some ways to do this to to accept uh, accept fear at the via zazen you know, let, let it be in there, let, let it float around and practice like we do with everything in Zazen. Practice not, not grasping it or, or, and not trying to fix it. Just try to locate it in, in, in the body. Is, is it in my chest? Is it in my stomach? Is it in my neck? Is it in my head, my arms? Try to physically locate the, the fear this kind of shrinks it um so that's a good, very good in zazen and then after zazen with with fear to, to speak directly to fear this is the befriending part the accepting part is try to accept it's in the body it, it's in there it's located it's okay and then befriending um and here where for me as as a playwright the the, the notebook really helps the the writing really helps and and i just want to say to fear you're here you're at the table you're my friend tell me what's going on just just give fear room to speak put the pen in fear's hand uh, or put the microphone in fear's hand if you don't like to write, but to give give a voice memo. Um, uh, do that, Wh whatever. For me, writing really lets my imagination go. It's a different, it's sort of imaginative zazen for me. So I just I just let fear speak. And then here in the third one, we, we don't abandon fear. So we let fear speak as long as it wants without interruption just write and write and write speak and speak paint whatever whatever we do until everything has been said and fear has almost grown tired as though it needs a nap and now maybe fear is listening open to listening to another voice other than its own and you so then i have found it really works to acknowledge fear at that point honor fear and thank it for its, its its great message that might be very important for our being to to hear and process um and and then and then the, this fourth one 
let fear know you've been the first responder. Great, you, you've alerted this system, uh, this body and mind to something that is, is really disrupting the, 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 the vibration. Really feels like, wow, I, I don't know how to take a step right now. So thank you for that. Um, and, and that uh, now, uh, would you like to, to listen? Would you like to have a conversation? And usually fear it, it says yes, it wants a conversation. And here's where I think is, it's kind of nice, the realization, sometimes we often think that dialogue only happens between me and Brooke or me and Anne, me and Trey, that we need two people. But really so many people and so many beings are living within us. Even a great Zen teacher is living within us. In fact, it, it, Buddha lives within us. Buddha nature is there. And that's a time when fear has relaxed a little, had its full say. It, it's a time to remind that even in fear, also Buddha is there. Also, also Buddha nature is there. So, so that's a time where I, I really um, like to just get into the play and invite now to the table. We have fear at the table. This is our friend. This is a person who's there. And now, we've, now we can also personify and invite some of the Buddha's teachings since Buddha nature is right there. And, and, and for this, I, I wanted to invite uh, the six paramitas and just go through how we, 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 uh, we might invite them. So I also think it's very important, you know, in, in our lives, what happens sometimes is we think the Dharma is kind of out there, that it's, it's somewhere over there it's in the temple over there. It's in the books. It's in the altar. It's in the zendo or something. It's in the orioki bowls. But really, dharma is is it's 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 right here. It, it it's always here in, in in our everyday life, and we just have to access it when um, it, on the spot. You know, we we it, like in, in that beginning poem realize that by doing zazen, by doing this practice, even though it doesn't feel like anything's happening du during zazen, um, something is happening, and the, and the uh, Buddha nature and and the Dharma, over time, is becoming less and less and less academic, and and more and more and more. It's coming into our body and mind. It's coming into the cells of our body every zazen period. Every time we, we study dharma, it's coming into our body and it's, and it's readily available. Just because we get very afraid or very angry or very sad or very... Um, uh, this another difficult emotion, like very... Um, uh, grief stricken, whatever, difficult emotions doesn't mean the Dharma isn't simultaneously there. The Dharma is simultaneously there. Just because the Dharma is there doesn't mean we're, we're not just still a regular old human being who's going to feel difficult emotions. So in the, right in the midst of difficult emotions, right in the midst of, of fear, um, we, we also can bring in the first parameter of generosity. And really to personify generosity. What does generosity mean, mean to us? In, in terms of, of, of the paramita, generosity, uh, it, it's about really not grasping at, at, at things, opening to something bigger than just the narrow ideas that we have, to have a generous mind. So generosity in terms of the Dharma can be three things, can be material gifts like dana, uh, giving spiritual teachings, and giving fearlessness. Well, fearlessness, that, that's a great thing to give to fear. Um, so to, to work with these things, maybe in the material sense, maybe fear would like a warm cup of tea. So we can make a, a nice cup of tea for, for ourselves, for fear, and, and, and give the tea. 
a nice material offering. Maybe fear would benefit from a reading from a, a Buddhist text that means something to us or a poem that means something to us, something that we're feeling good with that we tend to go to. Um, we, we can give that to fear, that, that spiritual teaching. Um, and, that, and then this, this knowledge that there, there's something uh, much larger, that there's a part of you larger than anything that, that is fearless. And to just let this fearlessness uh, be awake and alive and begin to speak on the page, begin to speak to fear. Because I know it, 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 it's, it's a funny thing, but it is, it's so true that simultaneously when fear is there, somehow fearlessness is also there. And it just needs to be given a voice, be given space, be, be given room, be, be given a, an invite. And then fearlessness can, can speak to fear. Uh, just loving fear completely without any need to change. No one's trying to manipulate fear, just offering some alternatives. And fear can di get dialogue back and forth with fearlessness. This, this, this second paramita is ethical concept ethical conduct which is which is really the the um the precepts the 16 precepts um the three pure precepts which is just taking refuge in buddha dharma and sangha um and then the 10 clear mind precepts to protect life not to kill to receive gifts not to steal to respect others not to misuse sexuality to be truthful not to lie to remain clear not to intoxicate ourselves or others, to speak kindly, not ill of others, to practice modesty, not to praise self at the expense of others, and practice generosity, not to be possessive of anything, to practice loving kindness, not to practice ill will, and then finally to cherish and polish the three treasures. So again, this might be a time to just uh, review the, the precepts and say, what what of these 16 precepts, what's speaking to me right now and what might be helpful to speak to feel right now, how might I might want to it for to come alive and, and speak to fear. So show fear this again and provide refuge for him. Don't, don't scold, just invite with generosity and love, remind fear that fear, you, you once received these precepts. And you can do it again right now. It can be fresh right now. We can, we can start over right now. It's nothing, no, nothing's wrong. We, this practice is just, we just start again. We just, we just pick it right up where, where we are. And if we're in fear, then we just pick it up from there. Uh, there's no need to panic. If, if we're lost, uh, without a compass or map or supplies. Now he, here are those things. So that's why we, we, we received this, why we took refuge. Here's compass, map, and supplies. Not in an academic way, but let these things try to, that, they're, that are already there because you received them. Trust and let them come through you and speak. And then the, the third parameter of patience. Let fear know is very important. You're not in a rush. Because if you're afraid, you can't act well in the world anyway. So you might as well just stop. Might as well just stop and just have patience. And patience is really such a dear friend that can wait and tolerate the unknown and the difficult and the frightening. Boy, it's great to have patience as a friend. And, and, and you have it. And I have it. You know, it's not located just out there. We, we, we have it. That, that's a nice thing. We received it. Let fear know that he's not alone. Patience is right here with a hand on his shoulder, rubbing the small of his back as he, as he sits there in Zazen. So he, even during Zazen, just bring patience. If fear keeps coming up, you can picture patience as a, 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 like a nice uh, massage there. Just like, he, it's okay. It's, it, it, it's okay. And then uh, the fourth parameter, uh, joyful effort. Uh, and so let, in this joyful effort can speak, let fear know that, that uh, joyful effort doesn't have to disappear when fear is there. He, he can show up, joyful effort can stand up and, 
and sweep the floor, uh, cook breakfast, walk the dog, fold the laundry, anything. Just kind of bringing fear along. Say, come, come on out of that chair, fear, and walk, walk with me or talk with me. So some, some activity. Invite fear to participate, to, to accompany joyful effort. Just like a good little, a good mentor, a, a good friend to, 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 bring, um, to bring fear along. Again, not trying to change fear's mind, just invite his body to, to, to come along. And, and then um, the fifth paramita of meditation, uh, in, inviting fear to again trust in zazen at this point. To, to let go of the grip of thinking as best it can do. Remember, we're already awakened. We, that we, we just forgot, you know? We keep forgetting that. We, we keep forgetting Buddha nature is there, walking simultaneously with us. So meditation can, can remind us, hey, fear, it, it, we, we're already there. We, we forgot that that's okay. And just sit down again, you know, for another period. Sit down, um, not to free yourself. Don't don't try to get out of the trap. Don't don't don't, don't let don't your mind doesn't have to do it. But just just be yourself. Just be there, and and Buddha was going to come up and help you. That fear, you're okay. You're completely okay as you are. Don't try to change a thing. Just sit, zazen. Hold, hold, let it hold you, like like. The womb once did like life is doing. You're breathing right now, not because you're trying to breathe, not because you're forcing it, not because somebody taught you to breathe. You know how to breathe. You're just like a fish in water here. You totally are supposed to be in this world. Everything is good. We 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 have it. We we got it together. So just that that reminder, that that gentleness, and then finally. Um, the six parameter of, of, of understanding. And, and I think here, understanding really to me it, it is, is love. Understanding is a very loving thing, not so much intellectual thing. And it's the two hands of compassion and wisdom just in, in together as, as one gasho. Every time I gasho, I think compassion and wisdom just together, you know, joy and sadness, whatever, it's, it, it's together. Understanding knows fear completely because because he's been there. He, you've been afraid before. So all this wisdom that comes up, you know it because you've been through this before. You you've done it. You've been afraid before. You you've come through it and 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 you'll come through it again. So understanding can speak with utmost clarity and hold the space between the words for a transformation of attitude for a fresh start. Can feed its self in the eyes of understanding, it can. So how to fear and understanding become, become one, become really good friends? Well, they, they already are. They're already one, they are, because they're, they're, they're already, they all live in, inside you already. So, uh, Finally, I, I, I just offer this to, to be playful, to, to imagine. In my case, write a play or tell a story, paint a picture, uh, photograph things, cook, cook things, whatever is your creative modality that can come up. Use upaya, use skillful means with, with yourself. We often think of a teacher should use skillful means with us. But, but really, we're, we, can, we know how to receive teachings also. We know what works for us. So we can use skillful means for, for, for ourselves. Um, and, um, and just know that th th this is our practice. Th this is our practice to, to heal ourselves and to heal, heal fear within ourselves. If we can't do this within ourselves, it's, you know, it's, in, it's really impossible to be able to do it for with another person and, and offer something to them we, if we authentically really be, befriend ourselves. Um, yeah, so finally, 
I said, find a skillful means that work for you. And, and please just don't leave fear alone to suffer and, and cause other beings to suffer. Because uh, again, the other side of fear can, can be anger and resentment when fear gets very difficult to hold. And now we're not just suffering with fear, but if we don't take care of fear, like a good friend, we can, you know, project out anger and resentment to others. And then it's, then we, we have that problem. Um, that, that this vow to save all beings starts, starts at home. You know, <laughs> we, have, we, have to, we, we have to save this being. We, we, we have to love this, this, you know, this little being here and, and, and take care of it. And sometimes that takes some time. Sometimes we have to just stop and, and, and be with our difficulties. Um, and, and, and to remember that um, we're, we're all bodhisattvas. We're, we're, we're there and, and, and we, fearlessness is in us, even at the times of fear, even when we feel like, oh no, I'm terrible. Or, I'm ashamed I did that or whatever. We're still fearless. It, it, it's there, it just takes some, some calm and quiet for, for it to surface. And, and then those paramitas can become not something separate from us, some academic thing, but, but really our, our, our friend. And finally, I, I say too, don't think you need to practice with all six. Maybe choose one sometimes, see what works for you, see what really speaks within you, what really feels most alive. And, and, and also to just get, get used to fear and see what it looks like, how, how it manifests for you and, and, and what it's about. Same way you can get used to what, what makes you really joyful, that's really important to know. What makes you feel really engaged what makes you feel really calm, but also what makes you feel really afraid. So we have each time more and more tools to, to work with it. And I think that's why when we say in, in this practice, it, it, it's continuous practice, there's not one final aha and it's over. And, and we never feel fear again, you know, but we get more and more and more and more tools. So almost immediately when it comes up, we can know, oh, I'm going to enter into a conversation. I'm going to invite fear. I'm going to immediately let it know that you might be the first responder to the situation. Thanks for alerting me, but I'm going to bring the team of physicians together and, and, and we're going to, we're going to work on it together. So, um, yeah, uh, thanks. I'm, 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 I'm so, thanks so much for listening. You know, this has been a, a, a really, uh, good practice for me to use that imaginative way of bringing in the, the paramitas and bringing in the dharma as, as sort of characters in, in the play to work with some difficult things that come up um, to bring the small self and the big self together. And, and thanks so much for your kind attention listening and very open to any questions, discussion. Thank you. <laughs>